Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us to discover the joys of bird feeding with the Mass Audubon. Are you looking for a way to brighten your yard and mood this winter? Backyard bird feed. Uh, well, are we in the spring yet? I guess we're in. The, I should have uh, changed that line, I guess. Uh, so backyard bird feeding is a wonderful way to attract birds to your property. Uh, still feel connected to nature while inside and get to know the characteristics and behaviors of common birds. So today we're going to explore different feeder types, the best seed to put in them, the birds they'll attract, how to art, outsmart the squirrels, and other ways to encourage bird life into your yard and community. And today's presentation is led by Scott Santino, who's the education manager and teacher naturalist at the Ipswich River Wildlife Sanctuary in Topsfield, where he has been leading nature education program, pro programs for Mass Audubon since 1999. Uh, he coordinates the sanctuary's volunteer nature guide program, uh, training adults in natural history interpretation, and he's also a faculty member of Mass Audubon's Birders Certificate Program. So all uh, 70 of us or so, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Scott for joining us this morning. And Scott, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Great, great. Thank you so much for having me today, Robert. And I am always thrilled when people take some time out of their day to join me and one of my favorite things to talk about, which of course are these wonderful charismatic animals that have feathers covering their body, which we call birds. Now this program will focus on how to enhance your yard and bringing birds to it, primarily through feeders and some other ways. What I'll start by saying right out of the gate is when we put bird feeders in our yards, we are doing it for ourselves. Uh, birds are, have been here before feeders, they're gonna be here after feeders. And so the food that they get from our feeding types, um, whether it be sunflower seed or, or suet or um, niger thistle, this is just a small supplement of the food that they get from day to day. So how are we going to go through today? Well, let's take a look at our agenda. So we'll start by, you know, talking really briefly about the beginnings of bird conservation in North America. If there was not an, a, a platform to protect bird species in the United States, we may not have much in the way of feathered friends to be able to enjoy today. Then we'll talk about why people enjoy bird watching. Bird watching is one of the most popular recreational activities in the United States. And, and there's no right reason why to do it. People enjoy it for various reasons. Then we'll don't have a yard. Maybe there's a community garden that you work in, or maybe there's a local open space. You know, you can apply many of these principles to other open spaces if you don't have a yard. And then finally, we'll talk about common feeder birds. Uh, I like to think of this as being kind of a, a little game where we will look at birds, we'll look at their characteristics, and then we'll reveal what type of bird it is. And I want for you to make sure that you're participating and putting in the chat what types of birds you think we're looking at. All right, so here in this photo is what bird watching was in the mid to late 1800s. Birds were used for women's fashion. And there was this trade called the millinery trade in which birds were killed, for example, on women's hats. And they weren't just killed any time of the year, they were primarily harvested during the spring months because this is when birds were in their most beautiful plumage. And what happened is that these birds that were being hunted, for example, this egret in the picture of the plume hunter, this is the time of year in the spring when birds are making nests, they're laying eggs, and they're feeding young. And so in many instances, these birds that were hunted never had an opportunity to help their young through their life cycle, and many of their nests failed. By approximately 1886, it was estimated that 5 million birds were being killed annually in North America for women's fashion, and many of these species faced extinction. In steps in what I, who I like to refer to as our founding mother. This is Harriet Hemingway. 
And so in 1896, Harriet and her cousin, Mina B. Hall, who were Boston socialites, were really getting, uh, you know, turned off by this idea of women's fashion. And by wearing a, a bird on your head, it showed kind of a, a social class or, or status. And so kind of the higher you were up in the social echelon in local cities, the more birds you would have on your head. And we're not talking just one wing, we're talking some hats had multiple birds, right? And so Harriet and Mina started to hold tea parties at their home in Boston and got their friends involved in boycotting buying hats with birds on them. And of course, unfortunately, at this point in time, you know, women couldn't vote. They didn't have a lot of political pull. And so what they did was they started inviting their husbands and husbands' friends into these tea parties. And eventually, they started what became known as the Massachusetts Audubon Society. It's North America's first formal Audubon Society. And so in a way, give thanks to, to Harriet Hemingway for starting the organization in which I have this wonderful opportunity to work for. Now, because of this grassroots conservation effort started by these two Boston women, it also led to the 1918 Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And this act prohibits people, even today, from possessing bird feathers, um, bird bodies, unless they're game birds, bird nests, and bird eggs. Now, I've never met a feather officer. You know, I'm not sure that there's a lot of people find on the ground. However, if you don't have the appropriate licensing and permitting, you know, for a migratory species, it is technically illegal for you to have them. And so that's just a little background about why and how bird conservation in North America started and why we have so many birds today that we continue to enjoy. This is the northern flicker. This is what I would call my spark bird. A spark bird is defined as a bird that makes you curious for the very first time. And perhaps you have a spark bird. Perhaps there was a particular bird you saw in your yard or on a walk or at a wildlife refuge or sanctuary that for the very first time it gave you pause and wanted to, you wanted to learn more about it. Well, if that's the case, you're not alone. Approximately 45 million people in the United States consider themselves bird watchers. And bird watching and just nature enjoying in general pre-pandemic was an $80 billion industry for the U.S. economy. And so you're not alone if you're someone who enjoys these beautiful creatures. You're not alone if you like to buy optics or travel or put bird feeders in your backyard. There's lots of people who are doing it. Well, why? Well, one of the common themes is that these animals are so beautiful. This is a green heron, and by just looking at the patterns in detail in this beautiful bird's feathers, it really lets us know that these organisms have such incredible design and beauty. For a lot of people, when you go bird watching, it's a gateway for you feeling like you're connected as a person to the greater wild world, world around you. And, and for, for many, especially given the last two years we've experienced, has been a really great part to, to feel like you're connected with nature and something bigger. There's also a sense of mystery that surrounds bird watching. Maybe you're hearing vocalizations at night and you're not sure what it is. Maybe it's your local owl, like this barred owl. Maybe you're curious to know what's pooping all over your car that's sitting up in the tree during the day. You know, so there is a, a, a kind of a, a puzzle or mystery to solve for many bird watchers in learning how to learn more and how to identify birds. They are also extremely social. Most birds you encounter outside, you're going to hear before you actually see them. They have a variety of vocalizations. Some vocalizations we call calls, others we call songs. This little Carolina wren is a bird that I find a lot of people here because they are common and they do like to hang around people's homes and they are really quite loud. And so we're going to take a moment and listen to the Carolina wren song.
And in listening to that song, Song of the Rhine, you could hear lots of other birds vocalizing in the background. Another reason why people like to enjoy bird watching is it provides an opportunity to look for these wonderful creatures while they're traveling. This is a photograph I was able to take while leading a group down in the Galapagos Islands. The Galapagos is a beautiful archipelago of islands that has a lot of what are called endemic species or species that are not found anywhere else in the world except for their endemic region. And so here we were looking at things like blue-footed boobies and Galapagos penguins and flightless cormorants. And so for some bird watchers, it gives them this wonderful excuse and or opportunity to travel and see the United States and beyond. Bird watching is also an opportunity from camaraderie. There are bird watchers who really enjoy birding with others. It's kind of a social experience or opportunity. You can see here in this picture, my friend Bill has a bird called a Florida scrub jay on his hand. I took this photograph down in Cape Coral, Florida, and you can just see the smiles on the, the folks in the background that were part of our, our bird community. Um, and, and you know we just really enjoy sharing information. We really enjoy helping each other see the birds and finding the birds. And what I would invite you to do is next time you're out and about somewhere and you see someone with binoculars or a field scope, ask them what it is they're seeing. Ask them what it is they are experiencing. And chances are pretty good they might tell you or share with you uh, something that you would have walked by otherwise. Maybe it was an owl roosting in a tree. They're also accessible. You don't have to travel the world to see good birds. You can see them in your own backyard, in your own public park. You can even see them when you're shopping at Market Basket or a local grocery store. Birds are everywhere. And this is one of the birds that we often will find in our feeders or around our feeders during the winter months, the beautiful white-throated sparrow. Okay, we're gonna transition next into ways in which we can enhance our yard through various food items, water, other things to attract birds. And what I'll do at this point, Robert, is pause and see if any questions have come in uh, given the, the first part of uh, the introduction of our program today. Uh, so uh, let's see, Scott, we did have a couple of questions come in before you started speaking. Uh, one of them I'm gonna hold off on. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I will ask Kim's question though, just to get the ball rolling. Uh, Kim asks, when should I put out a hummingbird feeder? So I'm not sure if she's, I guess she's referring to like seasonally. Yep, yep. And, and we'll certainly talk a bit about yep. that a little bit on, but the general rule of thumb is, you know, around late April um, is, is a good time. You know, there are various websites that track hummingbird migration. And so you can almost kind of see them coming up the coastline. And so, you know, I would say, you know, I usually by the time we hit, um, you know, Mother's Day at the latest, you know, somewhere late April, early May, you know, they may not come right away, but that's probably a good point, depending upon where you are in Massachusetts, of course, them being a migratory species and, and coming up from Central and South America, they're likely to visit the feeders in, you know, Plymouth and Barnstable counties before they make their way up to Essex County. But you should start finding your hummingbird feeders and, and, and dusting them off if you have them. Great. Thanks, Scott. Scott, we can keep going. I think the other question you'll prob we'll probably be more appropriate at the next stop. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So here is an image that I think a lot of us can associate with. It's the beautiful American robin hopping around on our lawns, uh, looking for food in spring and summer and in fall, right? And if you take a look in the lawn picture that, I, that I, I've taken here, this is a my lawn in my home, um, you know, it's not just this dense monoculture of perfect green grass. Uh, my yard has not been designed to look like a golf course. And so that's one of the keys that we're gonna get into today on how to enhance your yard to attract birds. So what I would ask you to do is I would ask you to, a to ask yourself, am I creating habitat in my yard? You know, if you're really serious about attracting birds and other wildlife, we need to create a habitat. And there are essential pieces that all living things need in order to be in their habitat. One is easy, right? The Baltimore Oriole has come to my 
uh, shepherd's pole to get food, to nectar on that orange. The gray catbird has come to my yard in order to take a bath and get some fresh water so we can put in water elements. The other one isn't as obvious and is one that I think a lot of people overlook, and that is shelter. And that's what the picture of the side of my yard is for. You can see that there are things like hemlock trees and shrubs, and these are important elements. your yard and it's a you know just kind of uh, this open space where potential predators could get them this is going to create a situation in which birds may not want to visit your feeders or your your um your, your bath so let's take a look at some of these other elements on how we can create better habitat primarily a shelter this is another picture of my side yard and what I have done is I've made sure that in my yard, um, I'm a bit of a green thumb as well. And so if you too like to put in your perennials in spring, I ask you to plant things that are native and things that are organic if possible. Native organic perennials are going to attract a number of insects and other invertebrates. And what do birds like to eat? They like to eat bugs. So by having uh, a variety of plants that will attract insects, you will also increase the likelihood of having birds visit your yard. Some of you may know the term snag. Snag is a term used to describe standing dead wood. Now, I'm a homeowner. I would never leave a big looming dead tree hanging over my house that could cause potential property damage, but off into the sides of my yard, if there are any standing dead trees, I leave them be. Standing dead trees or snags are in a lot of ways animal condominiums. You're gonna get invertebrates that use them and then you could have things like squirrels, you could have things like bats, you could have things like birds that are using the snags as well. And then you can see in this picture on this particular snag, I have put a bird box on. Now bird boxes are used by a lot of different species of birds that we call cavity nesting species. Many of our cavity nesting species can't make their own cavities. We call those species secondary cavity nesters. These include things like black cap chickadee, tufted titmouse, white-breasted nuthatch, eastern bluebird, for example. And so by putting up bird boxes around your yard, and in this case, I just screwed it into a snag or dead tree, we're providing more opportunities to attract birds. Let's now dive into the food piece. So this first feeder is one that some of you may be familiar with. It's called a tube feeder. And this tube feeder is designed for large seeds. And in this particular case, I like to put black oil sunflower in there. You can see a beautiful purple finch has come to enjoy the seed. Now, this black oil sunflower has husks on it. And so when the finches eat, sometimes they'll make a little bit of a mess. And you can see that there's a little tray that is, can be screwed into the bottom of the tube feeder, which helps to collect some of that debris so it doesn't end up all over your lawn. This tube feeder can also house mixed seed, but I don't recommend that we put a mixed blend seed in tube feeders like this, and I'll explain why. A fringe like this is going to want the high protein diet of black oil sunflower. And so if there's a mixed seed in there, it may put its bill in there and grab the cracked corn and go and spit it out. And then it may grab millet and spit it out. And then once it finally has its sunflower seed, then it will enjoy that. But in the meantime, it's wasting some of that seed that you've put in the tube feeder. And perhaps you don't want the seed on the ground to attract things like uh, chipmunks or squirrels or, or other rodents. And so uh, the other thing I'll add here about this tube feeder is that you can buy husked sunflower seeds. So that way you're not getting um, all the, the mess of black oil sunflower if you choose not to have to or want to rake up that, a pile of stuff at the end of the season. The next tube feeder here is called a Niger thistle tube feeder. 
And I'll, I'll mention a couple of the elements here on this particular picture. We have uh, these beautiful American goldfinches on the feeder. You'll notice that the holes in this tube feeder are much smaller. And so if you try to put a mixed blend or sunflower seeds in this tube feeder, the birds would not be able to get it. The flip side is on this feeder that we looked at a moment ago, if you put Niger thistle in this one, the thistle would just run on out and run all over the ground. So you need to make sure you're putting the right seed in the right feeder. This particular feeder, you'll see that there is a cage around it. This is a feeder that's designed to be squirrel proof. And so the goldfinches land on it and they're easily able to access the seed. If a squirrel jumped on this feeder, the cage would pull down and they wouldn't be able to access the seed. And so there is a method to trying your best to choose the right seed for the right feeder. Now, I haven't mentioned mixed blends yet because I like to put them on covered platforms. This is a great opportunity for you to attract birds that aren't comfortable clinging to the side of a tube. It's a wide open space that a bird can land on and be able to, you know, look around and, and, and hop around and grab the food items that they're interested in eating without creating a lot of mess. I also like the cover because, especially during the winter months, right here we are, it's not quite April, we could still see some snow. The covered platform will help keep the snow off the seed for the birds to be able to come in and enjoy a meal. Now you'll notice here on the text, I put avoid red millet. Red millet is an additive that you find in a lot of mixed blends, and it's a food item that the birds don't care for. And so if you're looking at different types of mixed blends, you're going to find that the ones that have red millet are less expensive, but it, there's more waste. The birds aren't going to eat all the red millet. If you buy the mixed blends that have white millet, they're going to be a little bit more expensive, but you're going to get more bang for your buck because more birds enjoy the white millet. Things like song sparrows, dark-eyed juncos, that white-throated sparrow that we saw a little bit earlier, um, morning doves. So the mixed blends have a place in your yard. We just want to make sure we put it into the right feeder. Another element is a suet cage. Suet cages are rectangular and you can buy cakes in which they fit right into that rectangular cage. And then birds come along and they cling to the side and they like eating that high protein powered diet that you've offered for them. A lot of woodpeckers enjoy eating suet. On this particular picture, I was surprised on a December day to see a splash of yellow on my suet cage. And so I took a closer look and it was a pine warbler, which for the most part migrate out of Massachusetts during the winter months. But this bird that enjoys eating insects in December when they were hard to find was able to survive by utilizing uh, some of the suet in my suet feeder. It was quite cold today and yesterday and Monday. And what I noticed at my suet feeders the last couple of days is that a newly arrived flycatcher called an Eastern Phoebe, which eats bugs, like its name says, it's a flycatcher, has also been utilizing the suet now that when it gets colder and there isn't as many bugs for them to find. Suet cages are not great for suet when the weather gets warm in May, June, July, August. And so one of the ways that you can transform your suet cage is by making it a nectar cage. And so here's an example of taking some halved oranges, putting those into your suet cage, and this will attract birds that I like to call nectivores. I have successfully attracted Baltimore Orioles, gray catbirds, scarlet tanagers, two oranges in my yard, and various types of woodpeckers will also enjoy nectaring on oranges if you put them in your yard as well. Now, bird feeders, there's no right or wrong way to do it. The best way to do it is to enhance what you want to see in your yard. One of the things that I do is when I reach Memorial Day, I take my seed feeders down and put them away for the summer, and then I'll put them back out for Labor Day. 
But there are some feeders that I have out during the summer months. And it's the one that I believe it was Kim asked the question about. This is a hummingbird feeder. We have one species of hummingbird that breeds in the Northeast. It's called the ruby-throated hummingbird. This picture happens to show a female ruby-throated hummingbird at a hummingbird feeder. They will you typically arrive in the Northeast in late April, early May. And by putting out these feeders, you should be able to see some of these beautiful birds nectaring. Now, if you go to a local bird and seed shop, you will find hummingbird feeders that come with pre-packaged nectar. And many of them are red. They have artificial coloring in them. And I would ask you not to use those types of nectars. It's been shown that artificial coloring and nectar will and does make hummingbirds sick. So the best thing to do is to go to your local grocery store, buy just regular old market basket, stop and shop, Shaw's granulated sugar, and you use one part sugar to four parts water. You boil it up, you let it cool, and then you put it into your hummingbird feeder and see what happens. Hummingbird nectar will spoil, and so I will say that regardless of whether they drink it all or not, I make sure that I put fresh nectar in my hummingbird feeder weekly. And then I also give it a little wash to make sure things like uh, molds and other things aren't gonna be growing in there as well. So there is maintenance involved in, in working with feeders. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. There is a certain sense of well, if I put feeders in my yard, am I going to be serving these poor birds up to birds of prey? You may have Cooper's hawks or sharp shinned hawks that come to your yard, and they're not coming to your feeders for the seed. These are birds of prey that eat small birds. Now, Cornell Lab of Ornithology has done a wonderful job in doing lots of bird studies, and, and their studies run the gamut. They've provided us a lot of information. And one of the studies that they've done looks at bird predation around feeding stations. And what they found was that there was less likely that hawks would catch birds at feeding stations in your yards around feeders. And the reason being is that when you have bird feeders in your yard, it attracts more birds, which means that there are more eyes, which means that there's more vocalization, which means that there's more warning. They are looking around together collectively and they'll give warning sounds to in case a, a bird of prey like this comes in. And so the notion that I'm going to serve my birds up to hawks if I put feeders in my yard has proven to not be the case. You also want to make sure that you clean your feeders on a regular basis. And this is extremely important because you don't want bird disease to be a vector at your feeding station. I like to, uh, what I do is I make sure that I take my feeders down and wash them at least once a season. I should probably do it a little bit more frequently than that. And what I do is I, I use like one of those um, big um, Home Depot buckets, you know, the orange buckets, and I'll put a 10 part water to one part bleach solution in there. And then I'll put the feeder in there and I'll let it soak. I'll give it a scrub and then I'll rinse it in my sink or rinse it in my tub or something like that. Make sure I get all the bleach and water out of it. And then what you wanna do is you wanna hang the feeder for a day or two to make sure that it has completely dried. You don't wanna put any seed into a tube feeder if there's still moisture inside. Otherwise, some of those sunflower seeds might end up germinating inside your tube feeder. If you do happen to see any bird disease at your feeders, and one of the most common examples of that is a type of bird conjunctivitis that we'll sometimes see on our finch's eyes. You should immediately take your feeders down, make sure you clean them, and leave them down for at least two weeks. Otherwise, around your feeding stations, the other birds that come in, they could end up picking up this highly contagious bird illness. And we don't want our feeders to spread illness, of course. All right, we're about to get into squirrels. And so I'll pause here for a moment. And Robert, do we have any questions about feeders 
um, before we move on? Uh, yes, uh, quite a few. Um, so Gail asks, how do you keep squirrels out of covered platform feeders? I guess we're going there next. We'll be going there next. All yep. right. Um, hmm. And then um, Margie and Carol ask about keeping ants out of hummingbird uh, feeders. Are you going to include that as well in the next uh, segment? I won't, but what I will say is that the ants um, will also, you know, I don't find that there is a situation where the ants or bees are in conflict with the birds. And in some instances, some of the birds that visit our hummingbird feeders will also eat the ants. And so uh, I can't say that I have let that bother me much. Um, if the ants do become too much of an issue, you know, there's certainly trial and error. And I would encourage you to maybe try putting your hummingbird feeder in a different location if the ants have become too overwhelming. Uh, Angela asks, uh, can I use mild dish soap to clean my feeder? You could. Um, I find that, that that's, um, you know, there's a lot of rinsing involved in there and making sure that you get all the soap out of it. Another item that I will sometimes use that isn't as invasive as bleach is white vinegar. White vinegar can also uh, you know, be an item that helps to uh, disinfect bird feeders without using um, you know, something as abrasive as bleach. And so that might be another option. The, the thing with um, you know, detergents is you need to make sure that you have completely got the detergents out of there before you put the seed back in. Uh, Kim says that she puts out uh, beef, uh, I, I might be mispronouncing this, beef suet uh, for downy woodpeckers. Uh, why will they not touch pork suet? So I guess they only like the beef suet. Uh, why is that, Scott? You know, I would have to look that up. I'm yeah. not sure. I can't say that I have come across um, that question before, nor have I experimented with, with various types of suet. So um, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I'll have to look more into that. Uh, Joan says, uh, when's the best time to put feeders out for Orioles? Um, first week of May, you know, uh, maybe even a little bit earlier if you're down on the South Coast. You know, when I start thinking about getting ready for Orioles and hummingbirds is kind of when um, we get into that April school vacation week. Um, you know, that's when some of those uh, short distance migrants and uh, are, are are here and that is kind of opening the way for some of these more long distance migrants who are coming in and so uh, if you're looking to attract orioles and hummingbirds we want to get those nectar feeders out, out you know again end of april beginning of may uh, along those lines Lori asks is it too warm to provide suet now no, I mean, it depends upon the suet, you know, if you're using, you know, 100% beef suet, um, you know, and we get some warm days, you know, th that could potentially spoil um, but the stuff that you buy at the grocery store or at a bird center, you know, it's, it's almost like uh, a, a Crisco or something like that, um, the type of suet that they make so that that holds up a little bit better in, in hotter weather. And so, again, I, I comfortably usually have my suet out to around Memorial Day without it becoming too messy. All right, a couple more, then we can move on. Uh, Margaret asks, how about grapefruit in lieu of oranges? I'm not sure, Margaret. Give it a try and let me know how it works out. That's a good question. And Angela asks, is vinegar to be used in the same ratio as bleach? You can, you know, uh, for vinegar, um, I don't know if there's a specific ratio. Um, you know, I, I, in my experience, I've just kind of done the old um, eyeball and, 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 you know, dumped some in and given it a scrub and then rinse. I don't think you need to make a, uh, a like a, a diluted solution when using um, white vinegar. You know, that's something that you could apply to your feeders or inside your feeders, give it a good scrub and then give it a good rinse. Um, I, I, I haven't come across, nor have I, diluted white vinegar in the cleaning my feeders in the past. All right, so we can uh, move on to the next section. And for anyone who asked a question, I think it was either covered or will be covered, or I promise to ask it in the future. Uh, but we'll move on, Scott. All right, sounds good. So squirrels. We have a few species of squirrels that you can find in Massachusetts. This is the most common diurnal or daytime squirrel. It's called the gray squirrel. 
For those of you that maybe have some evergreen trees in your neighborhoods or yard, you may see the smaller red squirrel. And then believe it or not, we also have flying squirrels that are nocturnal. And so in some instances, you might experience flying squirrels at your feeding stations or even in your bird boxes. Now, all of these animals are interested in getting an easy meal and they'll all try to get to your feeders. Now, some people who put seed out don't mind if the squirrels take some, others would rather not feed the squirrels. There is trial and error in finding just the right setup to try to prevent squirrels from getting to your feeders. This is what I have found to be really helpful and successful in my yard. These are all feeders that I have put up and you'll notice that they are all on shepherd's poles. I find that if you have the ability to pick up a shepherd's pole, they provide you great flexibility on where you can put your feeders around your yard. Then you'll notice that there is something on the pole of each of these shepherd's poles. These things that look kind of triangular are called baffles. And baffles prohibit mammals, like squirrels and chipmunks, from climbing up to get to your feeders. And as long as you have a well-secured baffle, these are really effective in keeping squirrels off your seed or away from your seed. They can jump. And so a couple of things that you need to consider when using the baffle and shepherd's pole system is you want to make sure that the, the baffle is up high enough such that the squirrel can't easily jump up and over. You know, they can jump a good four or five feet up. Um, six is kind of that, that general rule of thumb, but, you know, most shepherd's poles aren't going to provide you that much of a vertical lift. What I find is oftentimes the squirrel will jump up and try to, you know, get some leverage on the baffle and it moves and they slide off, right? The other thing is you want to make sure that your feeders are at least 12 feet out from somewhere in which the squirrels can jump from, whether it's your, your um, porch railing or a tree or a car, whatever a squirrel can climb up and leap from, you want to make sure you're at least 10 to 12 feet out from where they can get to the feeder. And again, that's why I'll say that these shepherd's poles provide you great flexibility in keeping the squirrels off. There are specialized feeders you can buy that are squirrel proof in which there are cages that go down or the bottoms spin around and fling the squirrel off so they can't get to the seed. And then the last thing that I'll mention here is that there are types of seed that you can buy that have cayenne pepper in them. And so squirrels will not eat spicy seeds. However, the, the, the spice in the seed will not deter the birds. And so those are a few examples or suggestions on how you can help reduce and or eliminate squirrels and other potential pests from your feeders. Um, I've also found this to be quite effective with um, raccoons who sometimes also want to get up and get to the suet cage. The one animal I will say that this will not prevent getting your feeders is black bear. If you're in an area where black bear are, are sometimes seen, um, you know, they have definitely done some damage to my feeders over the years in Southern New Hampshire. And so uh, this system will not help you with black bear, unfortunately. All right, so we're gonna transition here into kind of our final section. And that is, you know, we see these wonderful birds coming to our yards and they're eating from our feeders. And now there's this sense of curiosity of wanting to know what kinds of birds are actually coming to our yard. And so this can be a fun activity and it's a part of that, what I would call that mystery or puzzle piece that engage a lot of bird watchers. They wanna solve that puzzle. They wanna figure out what type of bird is visiting their feeder. This bird here is called a house finch. And you may have earlier noticed I showed a purple finch and the house finch and purple finch look similar and can sometimes be a tricky identification. What would help you with ID? Well, here are a few quick suggestions. By far, there are many more than these three, 
these are three that I find myself using, you know, as a as someone who enjoys birds personally, and also as someone who teach teaches people about birds. The first one is Merlin. This is a free application for your smartphone or other device. This is by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And what Merlin does is it takes you through a series of questions. Where are you? What color is the bird? What size is the bird? What time of year is it? You know, various questions like that. And then what it will do is will give you the most likely candidates of what would be seen in your area at that time. It helps you solve that puzzle. The middle picture is iBird Pro. This is a application for a smartphone and it is something that you do need to pay for. However, I find that it has wonderful information and the investment is really worth it. It gives you descriptions. It tells you about their life histories. It gives you range maps. It even plays the bird's vocalizations if you're trying to figure out what bird is singing outside your door. And then the last one on the right is the good old fashioned field guide book. There are a number of them out there. Again, there's no right one. I happen to enjoy the Sibley guide. Peterson's guide is great. National Geographic guide, Kaufman guide. There's a good number of them. I'm someone that prefers drawings to pictures in my guides. I think drawings provide a, an overall better kind of uh, view of a bird that you're going to look at where a picture is just a snapshot in time and sometimes birds can look you know not quite right if you don't get that perfect photo and so you know bird guides can be fantastic as well in helping to identify birds okay so here's what we're going to do we're going to look at a few common species these are all birds that you would expect to find visiting your yard or local open space if you were to attract them with habitat. And what I'd like you to do is we're going to put in the chat what type of bird we think it is. A kind of a bird jeopardy, if you will. You don't have to say what is <laughs> or in, in, in putting your, your chat answer in, but I do invite you to write in what type of bird you think it is. And we'll talk through some characteristics. Okay, here's our first one. All right, so this is a small bird that has a black cap and a black throat. It has what I would call a medium-sized bill. It has some length to it. It also has some width to it. This bird can utilize eating a variety of food types, including things like sunflower seed, suet. And if you have a black oil sunflower tube feeder, this is a bird that is going to want to visit your feeder. This is also a bird that will use bird boxes if you have bird boxes or snags with holes in them. If you said this is a black cap chickadee, the Massachusetts state bird, you are correct. A bird that often hangs out with the black cap chickadee and looks a little similar is this bird. You'll notice that this bird also has a black cap, but it has a white chin, throat, and breast. And this bird has a unique habit of walking headfirst down tree trunks. This is also a bird that I call a clinger, meaning that they do really well clinging to the sides of suet cages and tube feeders. This bird enjoys sunflower. This bird also enjoys suet. Do you know what this is? If you said white-breasted nuthatch, you are correct. Another bird that I find will visit my yard is this species. And if you're not familiar with it, this is not two different kinds of birds. Some of our birds have something that we call dimorphism between the sexes. The boys and the girls do not look the same. But if you look at the shape of the bird, if I took the color out of these pictures, you would see two birds that were the same size and shape and look at those big cone-shaped bills. This bird loves sunflower and safflower and other types of seed. However, they're not terribly comfortable clinging to the sides of feeders. So in order to track this bird, you would need that plate of your tube feeder, or you would need a platform feeder in order to accommodate this bird. And this beautiful red bird is, of course, our northern cardinal. 
The silhouette of this bird is really striking. It has a little head, it has a big round body, and it has a long pointed tail. This is a bird for a long time. I didn't really appreciate its beauty. It has a beautiful powder blue eye ring. And if you've ever seen one of these birds close its eyelid, it's, a, it's as if it put on blue eye shadow. It's absolutely striking. It also has these pretty dark spots on a pretty gray canvas. And one of the things that we all often do with this bird is we'll hear it before we see it. And it has a deep, mournful, or sad coo. This, of course, is our morning dove. And for a lot of people, I find that if, they, if you think you're hearing owls by day, chances may be you're hearing morning doves. Another bird that likes to hang out with black cap chickadees and white breasted nuthatches is this bird. It's small, it's a little bigger than a black cap chickadee, but it has a crest or tuft on its head. It almost looks like a miniature Northern Cardinal if you're looking at its silhouette. It has a white belly and it has something I like to call rufous flanks. If you look above the belly, but below the wing, there's this pretty little red hue color that you find on their flanks. This bird also enjoys tube feeders. It is also a cavity nesting species. And if you guessed tufted titmouse, you are correct. I will say for a moment, just to getting back to this bird, this is not bird that does well on tube feet, like doves and sparrows. All right, moving on from the tufted titmouse, we have this beautiful bird. This is a bird that I think is often considered a bit of a bully at feeders. They are just really, really smart and they know how to maximize their ability to get as much seed as possible. It has a big blue crest and it has this wonderful blue plumage or feather coat and it has a black strap. They too, blue jay, you are correct. Here is a bird that really likes suet. And this is one of our smaller representatives from this bird group. You can see that it has a little stout bill. And you can also see that on the underside of the tail, there is some black flecking. This is important to know because this bird has a larger, similar looking cousin. What is our most common woodpecker? It's this one. This is the downy woodpecker. And again, this is a bird that really needs snags in order to forage for food and also make cavities to roost and nest in. Roosting is a term to describe resting. And a lot of our woodpeckers will roost at night in tree cavities. Another large woodpecker or a large woodpecker, I should say, is this bird. And this bird is one that has been tied to how our climate is changing rapidly. This is a bird that has traditionally been a southern species. And so is it the cardinal and the tufted titmouse and the Carolina wren. There are a few birds that we think are showing us that climate is changing. This bird is also one that really enjoys suet and sunflower. It too needs dead trees in order to peck in, to make cavities. And a lot of people think that the woodpecker, well, it's a red-bellied woodpecker. This is why we do have a red-headed woodpecker that lives in the United States. Its entire head and face and throat and chin To 
all red. This bird, when that leaves up against the tree trunk, we don't often see it. But again, a beautiful woodpecker, the red-bellied woodpecker. This is a bird that we'll often see if you're in a little bit more of an urban area. This is an introduced species. And this again is showing um, dimorphism between the sexes. We have Mr. and Mrs. House Sparrow. For a lot of people, they prefer not to have house sparrows at their feeders. And so if you want to discourage house sparrows, you would just use tube feeders. They're not very good at clinging to the sides of tubes. The last bird that we'll take a look at here is this one. This is a picture of this species during the winter months. And now that we're almost in April, this bird is still starting to disappears from our region in winter. But what really happens is they look like this they become drab during the winter months. This of course is our American goldfinch and any of our finches, goldfinch, house finch, purple finch, they enjoy the Niger thistle feeders. All right, we're in the home stretch here. This is my last content slide, but this is something that I, I, I found is really, really important. If there's gonna be a big takeaway uh, from today's program, I hope this is one of the big takeaways. We all enjoy for a population of wild animals that is very well cataloged. And what the studies show that since 1970, to 20 with the bee birds in North America, in an annual calendar year, we would have typically had around 10 billion birds that occupied North America. And that study showed that we're down to about 7 billion. And that's really daunting. What can I do? to help birds. Well, guess what? We can all help birds. And here are seven simple actions that we can all do in our daily lives to help bird populations. We'll go through most of these quickly because they're fairly self-explanatory. And then there's one or two that I'll go into a little bit more deeply. Birds will often strike windows when they're trying to fly away from danger. Our windows reflect the foliage around them. And so we can make our windows safer by putting up decals and dots and things like that on the exterior to prevent the birds from flying into them. The other thing you can do is think 33. You could have your feeders at least 30 feet away from your windows, so that way the birds aren't likely to fly into them, or you could have your feeders three feet away from your window, and if that's the case, they won't be able to generate enough momentum to hurt themselves when they fly into the window. The second one is to keep cats indoors. Cats are wonderful pets. And we know that cats live a longer, healthier life if they are indoor cats. Because cats are a predatory mammal, when they get outside, they do what their genetics tell them to do, which is to hunt. And cats kill billions, yes, billions with the B, birds each year in North America and small mammals too. If you have a big lawn, and you're getting sick of mowing it all all summer long, we'll start to car carve up your lawn and put in more perennial gardens. Put in more plants for more animals like pollinators and birds to use, and then you just have less lawn that you need to mow. So it's a win. And when you put in chemicals, we'll get passed right on up the food pyramid. Drink coffee that's bird friendly. What on earth does that mean? 40% of the birds that spend part of their year with us in Massachusetts are migratory, which means they're going to go to Central and South America. When they spend the winter in Central and South America, they need forested habitat to find food, shelter, water. 
In those regions, coffee plantations have become a big trade. And what most coffee companies do is they clear cut the rainforest and they put up these monocultures of coffee plants because they're e easier to harvest. When you're buying that coffee, that cheap, you know, uh, types of coffee, I won't mention any names, you're contributing to the loss of bird habitat. At, on their wind, fair trade and bird friendly. They are a little bit more expensive, but you know what? It's worth the investment so that we can continue to see birds. And what I did in my local grocery stores, I went to the person who was in charge of the coffee aisle and I said, you need to start selling bird friendly coffee. And they were able to do so. And so you can use your vote of purchase power by some bird friendly coffee. Coffee, but our avoid plastics. Anytime that you cannot use, um, you know, use reusable bags or use your reusable water bottle. Reducing plastics helps birds, primarily seabirds, because a lot of that plastic ends up in our ocean. And then the final one is, the, you know, see what kinds of birds you can hear and see. Bird watching can be a bit contagious. And so the more people that you can get interested in wanting to learn about birds, the better off birds will be collectively here in North America. So I've taken us a full hour. I'm happy to stick around a bit, Robert, and answer more questions that have come in. And Thanks again, everybody. I know there's so many other things that you could have done today, right? You could be like washing dishes right now, or you could be folding laundry. I'm glad you decided to take an hour and spend some time with me today to learn about birds and how to attract them to our yards. So Scott, uh, yeah, we're in overtime here. Let's take five minutes of questions. Um, Angela says, thank you for this presentation. I'm learning to love birds. Uh, we had a few questions folks comment uh, and ask a question about your uh, suggestion of um, taking the feeder down during the summer. Uh, let's see here. Jane says, can you speak a little bit more to removing feeders in the summer? I've never done that. And then Lori asks, should I stop feeding mealworms in the warmer weather also? So th there's nothing wrong with keeping your feeders up during the summer months. My, what I like to do is, uh, well, when birds are nesting, they want to feed their young invertebrates, bugs. And when we get into June, July, and August, when they're raising and rearing young, they're going to be eating primarily bugs. And if you have perennials and plants in your yard, that's going to provide the bugs. And so a lot of the seed that we would put out during the summer months is potentially gonna spoil because the birds are less interested in that. We often will have strong summer storms and if the seeds get wet inside the tubes and so forth, then that seed spoils. And so for me, you know, I, I feel like to a certain extent, a lot of that seed just isn't being used, um, you know, in, 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 in a way to help bird populations. The other thing is, is that there are lots of rodents that also enjoy seed. And so if you don't want to help propagate things like chipmunk populations, the squirrel populations and things like that, it's also a nice opportunity to take down your, your seeds as well. So that's a personal choice I have by no means, but I tell people you have to do it. I just think it's a nice way to just, um, you know, focus more on your, your nectar feeders, focus more on your perennials and, and let the birds eat all the wonderful vertebrates that are around. Uh, so a lot of questions about that comment you made about bird friendly coffee. Um, mm -hmm. And Elena says, I really have no idea how to determine bird friendly coffee. And uh, we said so, so similar questions, you know, Renee says, how do you know what coffee is bird friendly? Is all fair trade coffee also bird friendly coffee? So it's as simple as putting it into a search engine. If you put in a search engine, you know, bird friendly coffee, um, a, a website will pop up. And that you enter your zip code. And then what it will do is it will show you all of the uh, 
stores in your area that sell bird friendly coffee. There is also a Smithsonian bird friendly seal. It's a little logo that says bird friendly coffee. And so there are a number of types of coffee that have that Smithsonian seal. I will say that there is a, you know, a fee that's associated with that seal. And so not all bird coffee vendors can afford it to be part of that Smithsonian bird friendly seal. And so, you know, just by spending a little time, um, you know, doing some research, you can find bird friendly coffee. I will say that for the most part, in most cases, but not all, if you're buying coffee that is organic and fair trade, chances are really good that it's shade grown coffee. And if it's shade grown coffee, that means you're helping birds. Carol asks, is there an app to identify bird sounds? And Kim asks, have you used Song Sleuth app? It's, it IDs birds from songs. So I can't say that I've used uh, the Bird Sleuth app. Um, bird songs are highly variable. And what I mean by that is that, you know, much like people have regional dialects, you got the Boston accent, you got the New York accent, you got, you know, the Texas accent, birds have regional dialects as well. And so some of those softwares that help you identify bird songs are not always terribly accurate bird song option. And I have found that one to be the most reliable. I will add though, that just spending time out in the field and learning yourself is a much more fun and enriching experience. And you're more likely to remember those songs for future reference instead of just holding up um, you know, an app and, um, and, and having it tell you what's singing back. There's a wonderful series uh, called Peterson's Birding by Ear, which is a, a, a wonderful tool that I've used that has helped me learn bird song. And so there are some options out there, but if I were to recommend an app to help you with song ID, I would use Merlin. Uh, we do have uh, multiple questions about squirrels, um, not preventing the squirrels from eating the bird food, but, um, you know, Rod wants to know, how do we include food for squirrels? Patricia asks, is anyone specifically feeding the squirrels? Um, so do you have any comments there, Scott? Yeah, you know, um, certainly squirrels like to gnaw, they're a rodent. And so if I wanted to provide an opportunity for squirrels to, to be able to get some food in my feeding stations, you know, I could always sprinkle some seed on the ground. That's always an option. Um, they're more comfortable on things like platforms. And so if I wanted to include squirrels in my, in my feeders, I would just take the baffle off of my shepherd's pole and I would let Squirrel front be able to have a platform feeder on my deck railing. And so that way I have an opportunity to see squirrels and other animals up um, closer to my windows. And so that's also an option. And so, yeah, you know, again, there's no, this is the right way how to feed birds. It really just has to do with your personal preferences and what animals you'd like to attract to your yard. And so, yes, there are a number of people who enjoy feeding the squirrels as well. All right, three more questions. Uh, Betsy asks, birds won't come to a red bird feeder that I bought. Does the color red scare birds away? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I would suspect that there may be something else going on with the feeder than its color that might be excluding birds. Um, I would definitely recommend uh, checking the seed. And I mean this respectfully. There was a person who I was helping with their feeders and they were very frustrated because birds weren't coming to the tube feeder. And I asked them to go out and take a look in the feeder. And what they discovered was that moisture had gotten into the feeder and the sunflowers were actually starting to germinate inside the tube, which meant that the food had spoiled. And so, you know, perhaps that's something Another thing could be just where your feeder is situated. Uh, you know, take a look at where your feeder is and ask yourself, am I providing enough shelter for a bird to be able to come to my feeder and then safely the 
get back to a, a safe location, but it's inexpensive and on clearance. This means that you're buying seed that has probably expired its expiration and they're just trying to get rid of it. And so if you want to give the birds the highest quality seed that's most likely to get consumed, you should probably go to a, you know, a wild bird store, a local uh, co-op store, you know, a place that's going to, you know, sell you the, the best seed, um, the freshest seed. So those are some of my thoughts on that. Um, another question, are bird baths helpful in attracting birds to your yard? Absolutely. Um, bird baths, you know, not only do they help provide some moisture for the birds, most birds get all the water they need through their diet and eating those yummy um, caterpillars and worms and so forth. Um, what I like to think about bird baths is it's an opportunity for them to, to you know, help clean themselves. Um, you know, if you wake up in the morning and you want to brush your hair or, you know, get rid of that bedhead, what do you do? Um, you jump in the shower. You get your hair wet so you can come out of here in, in puddles and in our bird baths there is a significant amount of cleanliness that you need to make sure you're doing you want to make sure that you're cleaning your bird bath um, you know on a daily basis because when you attract birds that come in chances are pretty good they'll also defecate in there and if the water gets kind of So Scott, I apologize if I'm a little uh, little bit of a lag there. I, I, I uh, every once in a while I, I lose you for a second. Uh, okay. So fi final comment goes to Amur. Uh, have to have to end with the Tuxbury resident. Um, they write, uh, I haven't uh, ever seen eastern bluebirds in my yard in the 30 years that I've lived in Tuxbury. Uh, this year, they are attacking my peanut feeder multiple uh, birds at a time. And I've noticed a lot of Tuxbury residents also posting a lot of bluebird pictures. Why the bluebirds all of a sudden? So bluebirds are also a cavity nesting species and we call them a secondary cavity nester, which means that they cannot make their own hole to nest in. And as Massachusetts, over the last woodlands in the state of Massachusetts now, are mature second growth forest. And with more mature second growth forest, that means there are more dead standing trees, which means there are more holes in trees, which means that we have more nesting cavities and habitat for bluebirds. There's also a number of organizations like Mass Audubon who do have bluebird boxes out of their ecosystem. And so I think that there's been some you know, deliberate efforts to bring back bluebirds and we just have better habitat now in Massachusetts for them. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Scott. Uh, wonderful presentation as expected. Uh, folks, look for an email for me uh, tomorrow with a link to this recording uh, and a link to a feedback survey. Please take 30 seconds to fill that out. Uh, you know, we had 75 uh, folks on the line, which was wonderful. And I want to thank the uh, Friends of the Tewksbury Library for sponsoring. And I want to thank those uh, other uh, four or five libraries, which I'll do, do uh, by name in the email tomorrow. Uh, Scott, any last words before we wrap up? Just thanks again uh, for some of you, if you're Mass Audubon members, thank you so much for being a Mass Audubon member and supporting our work. And uh, please come by and visit one of our sanctuaries. We have the Ipswich River Wildlife Sanctuary in Topsfield, and we have the Joppa Flats Education Center up in Newburyport. And so it'd be great to see you out for a walk sometime. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Scott. And I hope uh, you and the rest of the folks on the call enjoy the rest of their day. All right, folks, I'm going to end the call now. Thanks so much.